So welcome everyone to another webinar in the series of Cups and Cakes webinar series organized by CIVIS, European Civic University. Uh, today on the topic of multidisciplinary approach for next generation collateral co colorectal cancer management, uh, which is uh, uh, held today by our colleagues from the University of Bucharest, uh, Bianca Galaziano. I will just present uh, her today very briefly, and then I will give her the word for, for this webinar. Uh, she is a, a lecturer and a scientific researcher at the University of Bucharest in the Faculty of Biology, Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. And her main interests are, research interests are in the area of cancer management and developing modern tools for improving can cancer patients' long-term management, but also other topics related to this research area. She has quite an expertise in this domain and quite an interesting activity uh, for a long period of time. And we are glad to have her today uh, holding us this webinar on this particularly interesting topic. So, uh, Professor Galaziano, thank you very much. The floor is yours for, for today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Um, I'm very pleased and honored to take part to this very nice Cups and Cakes uh, Chivis uh, initiative. And uh, I thank you for the invitation. Um, as I, um, um, just a second to, project my, my presentation. Um, as I uh, promised in the uh, description of my uh, talk, I will uh, guide you today through a journey that starts in the lab, at the bench lab uh, in research and uh, hopefully ends up um, with a happy ending at the bed, patient's bedside um or with um, improvement of um, the patients called the colorectal pa cancer patients overall outcome i will give you some insights today about um our research uh, topics main topics and uh, about the results that we obtained in uh, in our lab and um, their potential uh, uh, applications uh, for uh, better uh, colorectal cancer management uh, in the future. Um, so um, for the beginning, um, allow uh, to introduce myself, to briefly introduce myself and to let you know how did I end up um, uh, in this uh, research um, uh, field. So I think that um, I have always wanted to become a doctor, but I ended up as a biochemist. Um, and uh, looking back, I uh, consider that this was a very inspired uh, decision that uh, I, have, uh, I have made. So I um, uh, graduated biochemistry, and then I uh, studied biochemistry and molecular biology uh, in a master uh, program where I had the opportunity to study the um, um, potential cytotoxic effects of some natural compounds on breast cancer cells. Um, this was a topic that was uh, very close related to the medical biomedical um, approach. So um, that was the moment uh, when I realized that this is what I wanted to, to do in my career. And I was um, lucky enough to um, uh, join that research group at that moment and for a PhD program. I was awarded at uh, that time uh, with a um, um, different um, uh, topic uh, for, for my research um, during my PhD. It was not quite related to um, cancer research, but it was in the, in the field of uh, biomedical um, research. So I, um, during my PhD, I developed um, um, primary cell culture um, by isolating human adipose derived stem cells from um, um, subcutaneous adipose tissue harvested from patients undergoing um, <clears throat> elective uh, liposuction procedures. 
Um, then I uh, characterized these uh, primary cell cultures in terms of um, um, expression of uh, specific mesenchymal stem cells markers. Um, and then I um, um, also um, characterized their potential to differentiate towards adipogenic, contragenic, and osteogenic lineages. Um, in order to um, investigate their potential use in um, tissue engineering and bio um, regenerative medicine applications. Um, this um, um, study was part of a, a big project that we uh, were undergoing in, uh, uh, in our department, in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, where I um, um, uh, did my PhD. Um, and this, uh, this project was led by Professor Marieta Kostake, who um, um, was uh, after that my, uh, my uh, mentor. Um, so um, what we did at that, uh, at that time, we harvested uh, these uh, stem cells um, and we seeded them in contact with uh, several types of biomaterials. Um, I um, um, designed um, some um, cell scaffolds, uh, biohybrids, um, aimed to um, deliver autologous stem cells at the injury site um, in order to um, 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 produce um, in situ um, novel functional tissues. So, um, for this, uh, we had a very interesting collaboration, fruitful collaboration with the University Politecnica of Bucharest, um, in particular with the uh, um, Advanced Polymeric Materials Group, which is currently led by Professor um, Horia Yovu. And um, it was that time when I started a very uh, dear collaboration with Professor Catalin Zaharia, who is still um, 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 my collaborator in uh, the field of cancer research and who uh, was always um, open to um, adjust his uh, um, um, studies according to, um, to our trend and to, um, be, to respond uh, positively to all our um, um, ideas. So, um, we, what we did at that uh, time, we uh, seeded these uh, human adipose derived stem cells into silk fibroin based hydrogels and um, investigated uh, the cell's behavior in contact with this, uh, with this scaffold. Um, but during time, uh, we also wanted to deliver together with this uh, biohybrids, not only cells, stem cells, but also um, active compounds like growth factors or um, even therapy like, um, I don't know, um, anti-inflammatory compounds, antibiotics, or um, um, even um, um, differentiation uh, inductor molecules. So um, this led me to um, take a life-changing decision uh, and to enroll myself uh, into studying pharmacy. I was very interested in um, um, understanding how um, these active compounds act on cells, how they interact, and how they could um, um, modulate the uh, behavior of the cells uh, in various conditions. So I, uh, I studied uh, pharmacy during my PhD. I graduated in 2014 from uh, the University of Medicine and Pharmacy, Carol Davila from Bucharest as well. I never practiced as pharmacist, but I can say that I uh, use the knowledge that I received in that time, uh, even um, now in, um, in my activity, whether we uh, talk about my teaching activity or um, the research that I, uh, that I um, uh, develop in, uh, in the lab. Um, so um, how did I end up uh, studying um, um, 
uh, colorectal cancer. Um, after um, uh, I uh, uh, graduated pharmacy and after defending my PhD, um, I developed uh, many um, collaborations with my former teachers from the pharmacy uh, faculty. Uh, and all these uh, collaborations um, were uh, targeting uh, the oncologic pathology. So um, I um, um, started this research direction by approaching colorectal cancer pathology, which is um, a worldwide um, um, concern um, and which uh, gained um, a lot of benefits uh, from the late discoveries of um, made in the scientific field. So there are many um, uh, factors that may uh, interfere or may um, 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 may interfere with uh, with this pathology. And um, I would also like to, to highlight that um, uh, histologically, the colorectal cancer uh, has many um, subtypes. So this is um, a highly um, heterogeneous uh, pathology. And um, also it is very, like all uh, tumors, is very uh, susceptible to um, mutations during time, especially during, uh, during uh, receiving the therapy. So um, there is another um, concern regarding uh, the treatment and the outcomes of these uh, patients, um, the lack of uh, drug specificity for this, uh, for this uh, uh, pathology. So um, we um, decided to uh, approach this, uh, this pathology uh, by several, developing several uh, research directions. Of course, that we started with uh, um, uh, the screening of new drugs because uh, my collaborators in the uh, faculty of pharmacy were were proposing um, new molecules, and I will um, discuss about this, um, actually about all uh, the research directions uh, in the next few minutes. Um, and then um, we um, aimed to improve the um, bioavailability and the uh, specificity of the um, uh, current um, uh, drugs for um, oncologic uh, patients by um, developing uh, nanoscaled delivery systems that um, could control and uh, target, uh, control, control the release and target the release of, uh, of these compounds um, towards the desired cells. Um, then the, the third research direction that uh, we develop um, is the disease modeling because um, we uh, uh, identified the necessity of um, um, simulating um, in vivo-like um, um, environment in order to obtain relevant uh, results uh, in the um, um, first uh, um, two research directions that I have uh, already presented. And the last uh, research direction that I will discuss about today is the development of liquid biopsy approach, which uh, is um, um, the research direction that has the most prominent impact on, uh, on uh, patient's uh, outcome. And I will um, discuss this um, uh, when uh, the time will come for this um, uh, topic. So um, starting with the first one, um, I um, uh, had the opportunity to work with um, colleagues from uh, the pharmaceutic chemistry uh, department in the faculty of pharmacy where um, um, Professor Diana Nutza um, develops um, uh, designs and also synthesize um, some um, uh, active compounds based on their uh, chemical properties. Um, and um, I uh, uh, had the opportunity to test several series of, uh, of compounds 
Um, and uh, the ones that attracted much attention were uh, the benzanilides. Um, I presented here only uh, for um, an example, uh, some of our um, results. This is the spectra that we um, obtained for uh, the analysis of uh, one compound that we found to have um, a very interesting uh, biological activity on um, uh, colorectal cancer uh, cells. And uh, also I presented here um, uh, cell viability screening, um, which was performed um, using a fluorescence microscopy um, approach. Uh, we did the live dead staining. So we um, uh, double stained the cells uh, for uh, highlighting the living and the dead cells within the um, cultures that were treated with, uh, with our compounds. Um, in, uh, uh, on the other hand, we uh, also performed a cell viability uh, test, which was a quantitative test. It's called the MTT assay. Um, and um, this particular assay is uh, widely used to determine the inhibitory 50 uh, dose, which is uh, usually used as working dose for um, the compounds that are selected to be further investigated. Um, Next, I would like to highlight um, other two collaborations, uh, one with uh, Professor Valentina Uivaros, who is the um, uh, chief of the inorganic chemistry department in the Faculty of Pharmacy, and who um, develops very interesting um, chromium complexes with flavones with high potential to be um, used for um, as adjuvant. Uh, in um, uh, cancer um, uh, therapy, and also a collaboration with uh, Professor Carolina Negre, who is um, a professor in the uh, toxicology department in the Faculty of Pharmacy, who actually initiated um, um, this um, um, research path into uh, colorectal cancer um, investigations. She proposed for the beginning a study uh, for the screening of um, um, some active compound cytotoxicity on uh, colon, normal and tumor colon cancer cells. Um, of this, I would like to mention uh, capsaicin, which was extensively studied in our lab, and we uh, also have some publications together. Um, and um, from this point on, um, together uh, with um, uh, Professor uh, Katalin Zaharia, uh, we um, developed some um, uh, nanoscale delivery systems to target uh, and to release in a controlled manner uh, antineoplastic um, um, compounds, whether we talk about conventional chemotherapy or um, natural compounds like uh, capsaicin or um, silymarine or other um, compounds. Um, we also had the opportunity to study this uh, um, um, subject within um, um, a few research grants that uh, we were. Um, that we received from National Founding Agency. Um, and um, we uh, screened uh, many types of um, um, polymeric nanoparticles, um, of which I will, uh, I selected for the today's presentation, um, a nanocarrier that was uh, designed based on a silk uh, fibroin um, uh, polymer. So first, I would like to highlight the advantages that uh, this approach brings uh, to uh, patients, the potential advantages that this approach could bring to, to patients and to, um, to chemotherapy. First of all, uh, these nanoparticles have a very good weight surface ratio, uh, enabling 
um, the absorption or um, encapsulation of a significant amount of uh, compounds. Um, they uh, are able to transport and deliver uh, molecules uh, inside the human um, vascular system. Um, they improve uh, the biodistribution of, uh, of the drugs and uh, this way they um, have a um, significant impact in lowering the administration doses. Um, also, they might uh, target uh, specific cells, lowering this way the um, um, unpleasant side effects that uh, chemotherapy um, brings uh, to almost all, all patients. Um, and lastly, but not least, these nanoparticles protect the, the compounds by encapsulating um, them. Uh, this protection is important. Um, for some particular compound like 5-FU, uh, who is uh, susceptible uh, for degradation in, uh, in the bloodstream. So as I mentioned, there are many types of nanoparticles um, and we tested, we screened um, um, a lot of, uh, of um, uh, compositions. Um, and um, today I will talk about um, the silk fibroin uh, nanoparticles that were developed in the um, a group of um, advanced uh, polymeric materials uh, by Professor Catalin Zaharia. So um, this um, entire uh, study that I will present you uh, is divided in, uh, was published in um, three, uh, uh, papers, scientific papers. Um, so I will highlight um, um, the papers when uh, um, I will um, present the results. For the beginning, I would like to explain how um, um, we um, um, perform, what is the workflow in our lab in order to um, start the uh, screening of a nano uh, delivery system from scratch uh, until uh, eventually um, performing studies on uh, animal models. So for the beginning, our colleagues um, synthesize and then um, characterize um, the nanoparticles, the drug delivery systems. They, they design them according to uh, some uh, specific um, 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 parameters uh, that they um, will um, um, investigate after the, the synthesis. So it is very important to know the size of the nanoparticles, uh, size distribution, their morphology, the um, um, drug uptake, and also the uh, drug release potential in order to uh, validate them as uh, potential candidates for in vitro or end in vivo studies. So after we have this uh, first step done in the um, University of uh, Polytechnica of Bucharest, we uh, take the nanoparticles and determine the um, um, inhibitory uh, uh, concentration 50 dose uh, by seeding um, um, colon, can colon cancer uh, cells in 96 well plates and treat them with several concentrations of uh, um, nanoparticles, of drug-loaded nanoparticles. After 24 hours, we investigate the cell viability uh, within the treated cells as compared to um, untreated uh, reference. After determining this uh, inhibitory uh, uh, concentration, we um, start a basic screening of cytotoxicity in order to evaluate um, the potential cytotoxic effect of these nanoparticles on um, adenocarcinoma cells in culture systems. And then uh, if they pass this uh, test, we go uh, for forward to investigate their um, um, to investigate uh, their um, potential mechanism of action. So we, um, we do some advanced studies 
uh, and in the end, we investigate um, um, their um, um, potential use in animal models. And as you will see in the next few, few slides, also in the contact with human blood. So um, regarding the first um, um, screening um, um, steps, we have published a paper in um, um, a Pharmacia journal in uh, um, at the beginning of uh, the last year, and we described there um, the um, um, way that we obtained the working dose um, and um, the um, viability of the cells. Um, so for investigating the um, uh, cyto potential cytotoxic effect of the nanoparticles on human adenocarcinoma uh, cells, we performed um, two assays, uh, which investigate the metabolic status of the cells. One is a quantitative assay, uh, and the other one is a um, qualitative and imagistic um, a fluorescence imagistic assay. Um, as you can see, we uh, always compared our samples with an untreated control, uh, and we used as samples um, a pristine um, nanoparticles um, and a um, set of um, drug-loaded nanoparticles. As you can observe uh, in time, um, the cell viability increased in the control in the untreated uh, sample. Uh, however, um, this was not happening when we treated the cells with 5-FU um, loaded drug delivery systems. Uh, what is very interesting and um, was um, 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 very, a very important uh, information for us uh, that the pristine nanoparticles did not exert cytotoxic effects on uh, cells. So we did not want to um, uh, observe cytotoxic effects induced by the nanoparticles themselves, but um, induced by the release of the drugs from the uh, nanoparticles. So um, this quantitative um, results were confirmed by fluorescence microscopy assays. Uh, we have here a staining for the cells nuclei with the DAPI, with, it's a blue fluorescence, and uh, the red fluorescence um, is the mitotracker staining for uh, mitochondrial activity. And um, you can observe that um, in time during 74 hours of treatment, um, the control and the pristine nanoparticles, um, um, the, the pristine nanoparticles did not exert um, any um, harmful uh, effects on the mitochondrial activity as um, it was um, the same comparable with the untreated sample. Whereas uh, the 5 FU loaded nanoparticles decreased the um, uh, red signal, the red fluorescent signal for the mitochondrial activity um, from the very beginning of our uh, study, from 24 hours. Um, then um, we also performed um, uh, live dead staining. I presented um, earlier the uh, principle of this, uh, of this uh, investigation. Uh, we have uh, highlighted with green fluorescence the living cells and with red fluorescence the dead cells. And we can observe that in control and also in the samples treated with pristine nanoparticles, cells proliferated, um, which was not the same case uh, for the um, uh, samples treated with um, uh, five FU loaded nanoparticles. Um, and in the end of this basic screening, uh, we investigated the cell morphology in contact with this treatment. And we observed that um, under um, the treatment with pristine nanoparticles, as well as in the untreated sample, um, 
cells uh, proliferate and uh, form um, aggregates, um, whereas after the treatment with 5-FU loaded nanoparticles, these cells do not proliferate and are not able to attach one to each other to, to aggregate. So this uh, pattern um, is interrupted when treated with this 5-FU loaded nanoparticles. Um, considering these promising results, we uh, moved forward and um, did some additional investigations, uh, even in uh, animal models, and we published uh, our results in a nanotoxicology journal um, in somewhere in the middle of uh, last year. Uh, what we did uh, in vitro in, uh, in our cell culture facility we investigated the um, um, apoptotic potential of these uh, um, nanoparticles uh, by uh, using flow cytometry as, um, as the main technique. Uh, we used two uh, different assays in order to confirm um, uh, our results. First of all, we um, investigate, we did the staining for uh, annexin and propidium iodine, and then we investigated the expression of um, um, uh, caspase uh, 3 and 7. Um, next, we investigated the DNA fragmentation uh, under uh, the treatment with pristine unloaded nanoparticles and uh, with 5-FU loaded nanoparticles. And we observed that using the comet assay uh, technique, uh, after um, 72 hours of treatment with 5-FU loaded nanoparticles, our um, cells displayed um, highly fragmented uh, DNA. Um, moving to the um, in vivo studies, um, which were performed um, uh, together with a um, very dear collaborator of ours, Professor uh, um, Anka Hermenan from the um, Vasile Goldish uh, University from Arad. Um, um, we observed uh, that um, this approach uh, encapsulating 5-FU in um, silk fibroin nanoparticles could significantly decrease mucositis. So we all know that um, patients receiving 5-FU for colorectal cancer uh, or even for other cancers um, uh, are uh, highly affected by the um, 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 severe um, symptoms that mucositis might um, um, present in this uh, in these patients. So um, we encapsulated nano uh, five FU inside these nanoparticles to protect the gastrointestinal tract um, uh, of the harmful uh, and cytotoxic effects of this drug, and. Um, to uh, targeted release this drug in, uh, in colon. So um, we have here um, two panels uh, of um, uh, images obtained after um, um, histological staining of um, um, the jejun and colon tissues. And we can observe that uh, when we uh, use 5-FU um, as treatment in mice, uh, we obtain um, images very similar to, the, um, to those obtained after the treatment with uh, silk fibrin um, nanoparticles loaded with, with the drug. However, the um, pristine nanoparticles did not induce modifications uh, and are very, the images are very similar with those obtained in the control um, uh, mice. This is um, the same observation are uh, valid for uh, both um, uh, sites, gastrointestinal sites. Then uh, we investigated the expression and specific distribution of MOOC1 in uh, these two gastrointestinal uh, sites because um, 
um, this is a very uh, important information for um, evaluating uh, mucositis. And uh, the previous information were confirmed by, uh, by these histological uh, stainings as well. More, we uh, performed also ultrastructural um, um, investigations in order to um, better understand uh, what is happening um, in the gastrointestinal tract of the mice that receive uh, 5-FU and uh, silk fibrin uh, nanoparticles loaded with 5-FU. Um, and uh, our um, uh, conclusions were that these nanoparticles um, are indeed um, uh, very helpful to protect the gastrointestinal tract. However, maintaining their potential to release the drug at the uh, desired um, um, site. So uh, we moved even forward and um, investigated the uh, potential interaction of these cells with human blood. Um, First, uh, we uh, wanted to see whether these nanoparticles indeed um, um, uh, are able to enter the cells and we um, stained them with a fluorescent dye and then uh, performed a, a flow cytometry um, assays in order to investigate the level of fluorescence inside the cells. And after that, we exposed um, human blood. So um, we um, um, donated um, a, a blood sample in order to investigate the interaction of, uh, of the human blood with, uh, um, with these nanoparticles. And uh, in the end, we uh, also investigated um, uh, cells potential to uh, migrate and invade um, uh, other layers uh, in the presence or absence of the treatment with um, uh, 5-FU uh, loaded nanoparticles and pristine nanoparticles. Um, the third research direction that we approach is um, uh, disease modeling. And this is a research direction that sustains the uh, previous ones because considering my uh, previous experience uh, in during my PhD with three-dimensional culture systems, I uh, was assuming that um, uh, this two-dimensional culture systems might not mimic very well the in vivo like uh, tumor micro environment. So we developed several um, culture systems. Um, the, first, uh, the first ones are, um, were the ones that were very similar with those that I have studied during my PhD. So we developed together with Professor Zaharia some three-dimensional scaffolds uh, seeded and seeded them with um, 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 colon cancer cells. But then we moved on and developed scaffold-free three-dimensional culture systems that um, uh, are also known as spheroids or organoids. We used for this uh, many types of um, commercially available plates like uh, Perfecta hanging drops or AgriWell plates. Um, and we obtained um, nice uh, um, spheroids, as you can see in this uh, image, and um, used them to screen our delivery systems. Um, we um, um, obtained, as we as we assumed, we obtained very different results from from our b-dimensional culture systems. So we decided to move forward even more for, forward with this research direction and to approach um, microfluidic tumor on chip culture systems, uh, which um, have the great um, advantage of um, um, allowing the perfusion of the um, um, treatment. So they uh, mimic even better the um, in vivo like 
conditions. Um, currently, we use in our lab uh, the Mimeta sculpture system uh, and also uh, some, some um, uh, microfluidic systems from Darwin, but we uh, are currently developing this, uh, this research direction. And lastly, but not least, the um, research topic that is very uh, close to my heart because uh, we have uh, um, um, two uh, research grants that uh, were um, um, financing this, uh, this research and also because this, uh, this research is very, um, has a very prominent uh, impact on uh, patients is the liquid biopsy approach. So uh, we all know that um, not only colorectal cancer, the cancer diagnostic uh, is put uh, based on uh, tissue biopsy and also imagistic analysis. But um, these um, um, investigations are um, um, made uh, only um, at the diagnosis uh, time point. So they are uh, one in a lifetime um, uh, analysis. So when a patient um, uh, finds out that he uh, might have colorectal cancer or if you know, he uh, has a confirmation for this pathology after um, colonoscopy, for example, um, uh, the patient undergoes uh, surgery because surgery is the um, main curative approach for this uh, pathology. And um, the um, tumor that is extracted from patient is then uh, analyzed and characterized in the lab. Um, due to the um, progress that research has made in the last uh, years, we have now many tools to analyze um, the tumors. And we can, uh, we know that uh, tumors, colorectal cancer tumors are uh, highly heterogeneous and that um, each person, each individual has its own um, um, genetic signature of uh, um, um, the, the tumor cells. So uh, we now we can approach in a very personalized uh, way patients in order to um, uh, recommend the uh, best treatment for their particular um, uh, profile. Um, but this um, approach has a major um, disadvantage. And um, that comes from the fact that um, uh, tumors uh, are susceptible for uh, mutations, uh, mutations that will uh, eventually induce a drug resistance. So, and the information that once was, uh, uh, was clear and uh, true uh, after a few months uh, might uh, be um, not um, um, not true, not true for uh, for the patient. So um, it would be very good to have um, uh, an analysis that could um, give us uh, information about the prognostic and um, uh, how to modulate the therapy in real time. So this is exactly what liquid biopsy does. Liquid biopsy is um, analysis, um, um, very easy to perform uh, non-invasive analysis that um, um, approaches um, two main um, um, circulating biomarkers that sheed actively or passively from tumors. And these are the circulating tumor cells and the circulating tumor nucleic acids. Um, as I previously um, mentioned, um, we had the opportunity to um, study uh, these uh, two uh, strategies, both the circulating tumor cells and the circulating tumor nucleic acids. The circulating tumor cells are relevant to um, determine the um, patients, um, 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 the prognostic of the disease, 
and um, they also are useful um, to uh, for uh, primary cell cultures because uh, we can uh, culture these um, isolated cells and um, um, extract the material uh, the genetic material or to use them for other for other studies regarding the circulating um, uh, tumor nucleic acids um, they are very useful to determine the um, um, genetic uh, makeup of the part of the patient's tumor in order to to determine um, the particular um, um, uh, genotype of the, the patient and his um, susceptibility to uh, respond or not to uh, some targeted therapy, which is available um, uh, for colorectal cancer pathology. Um, we uh, developed these studies in, within the University of Bucharest together with um, um, diagnostic, oncologic diagnosis uh, lab uh, in Bucharest with Onco Team Diagnostic. Um, and also uh, with the great support of um, um, a team of physicians, op team. Um, they are uh, surgeons um, specialized in um, oncologic surgery, and uh, they are um, willing to uh, support and to fight together with their, uh, with their patients to cure this, uh, this pathology. Uh, they uh, call themselves uh, a team with a dream, and we are very happy to uh, be able to support their dream with uh, our research. So uh, regarding the circulating tumor cells, we uh, developed the flow cytometry uh, protocol to detect um, uh, these uh, very rare cells in the human blood. Uh, we can detect them based on uh, the expression of EPCAM, um, uh, pan-cytokeratin, and MUC1. Uh, and uh, then we also um, developed a protocol to enrich these uh, um, samples uh, for a better um, uh, isolation and count of the cells. Um, we performed a positive selection uh, strategy. Uh, we adopted a positive selection strategy and also a negative selection strategy based on CD45 cells depletion. And this, the last one, um, turned out to be um, the one that um, uh, was very uh, useful for our um, experiment. Regarding uh, the second project approaching the circulating tumor nucleic acids, this project is uh, still ongoing. Um, uh, we are uh, collecting data, so um, I, I uh, do not have uh, um, research data to present, but I can tell you that we harvested um, uh, peripheral blood samples from patients uh, and um, tissue biopsies extracted the uh, nucleic acids and performed next generation sequencing to determine the um, genetic profile of uh, the patient's tumors. And what we want to see is uh, if we can compare the um, uh, genetic profile that we uh, identify in uh, tissue biopsies with that um, uh, that we can observe in, uh, in uh, plasma. So um, up to date, um, we uh, have promising results that will be published hopefully soon. And um, lastly, I would like to um, um, present a um, um, project, a very dear project uh, of mine um, that, um, that was um, born from, uh, from my um, uh, um, desire uh, in uh, connecting people from several types of, uh, from several fields of research um, in order to um, uh, obtain the best outcomes for, uh, for uh, cancer patients. 
So um, I consider that uh, people coming from different um, research uh, domains have to uh, speak the same language, have to understand themselves. So it is very important to uh, understand uh, the language of uh, researchers, the language of uh, physicians, of uh, engineers, and so on, in order to um, gather all the knowledge and uh, in the benefit of the patient. So I have founded the um, OncoHub conference, which is the national conference. Uh, it has its first edition in uh, um, uh, October uh, last year. Uh, and we hopefully will um, uh, have our second edition in June this year. Uh, this uh, conference uh, was structured in six uh, sessions. Uh, we approached modern diagnostic strategies, patients rehab and multidisciplinary long-term support, oncologic surgery, of course, clinical oncology, drug discovery and nanotechnology, and in vitro cancer disease modeling, preclinical and clinical studies. Um, I have to mention that uh, every single study that I have performed in the colon cancer research field, uh, was done um, together and with the valuable help of my colleague and also friend, Ariana Hudizo, who is always um, um, together with me and we, we are a great team together. And I want to thank her very much for her support. And also I would like to uh, thank to my colleagues, um, Associate Professor uh, Octave Jingino, who is the leader of uh, the surgical oncology team, OP team, and also to Professor Catalin Zaharia, who um, is an um, engineer in the field of um, um, biomaterials. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much also, Professor Galaziano, for a very interesting and rich presentation on the chosen topic. I think that anyone who will, well, the one who attend, but also the one who will watch the video presentation of the webinar will be very enriched after this, uh, this experience. So thank you very much. Now, of course, if everyone, anyone from, uh, from this meeting has any questions or concerns or aspects that wants to, to address, please uh, do so. You can open your microphone without any, any problem. So while, while waiting the, the questions, I would like to add that uh, um, I uh, gladly accepted this, uh, this uh, invitation because uh, I wanted to, to share my knowledge and also to increase the visibility of our research and uh, to express my uh, interest in developing uh, new collaborations. So if anyone in the audience uh, would be interested in uh, approaching this uh, subject, I would be uh, very happy to um, um, and open for a, for a new collaboration. Thank you very much. Well, of course, if there will be no other questions or aspects to be mentioned, we would like to just thank you again for this presentation and for hosting this webinar because actually were, you were the host of it since uh, taking uh, a rich time of offering us valuable information. And we wish also a lot of success on the further research aspects. And we, we are assur assured that the, you, will, uh, you will offer us valuable research outputs in the, in the near future. Thank you, and thank you for, uh, for this opportunity. And I would like also to thank uh, Professor Kifiriuk, Carmen Kifiriuk, who uh, proposed, uh, proposed me for this, uh, for this webinar um, and for hosting this, uh, this very interesting uh, uh, um, talk. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and we will wait you for the other webinars in the Cups and Cakes series. Have a nice day and be fruitful in everything you do. Goodbye. Goodbye. Have a nice day.